Good to see you all. Glad you're here. Want to send out a special welcome to Marlene and Linda and my sister sitting back there in the back, slipped in, and uh, you just make yourself right at home. It's our treat to have you with us. God bless you. They came, Linda and Marlene came from Ohio to see Mom. She'd been looking forward to that visit for a long time, and they had a wonderful time, and uh, God bless you all. It's our treat to have you with us. They're uh, just friends of the family for uh, as long as I can remember. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm going to ask you to find that, and then don't put your Bible away because we're going to hopscotch our way through the Scriptures today, and uh, so you're going to need to keep it out and uh, just see some stuff for yourself. This is uh, a message that would probably be more as a Bible study, what I would do on Wednesday night. And, and if you're not coming on Wednesday night, you're missing it. You need, to, you need to join us. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful service. You need something in during the week to pick you up. and Because uh, if you're just going from Sunday to Sunday, you, you come in here just dragging it, just huffing and puffing and <laughs> I need God. <laughs> you need something during the week. Join us on Wednesday night. But this is more of a Bible study, but it's, but it's the message. And uh, as Peter said to the, to the fellow at the gate, beautiful silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give it unto you. And that's where we are, such as I have, right here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we're going to be. For a moment, I mean not long, but, but for a moment, Verse 1 says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. How you ought to walk and please God, so you would abound more and more, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. He is saying, you remember when we were with you how we shared, but I'm writing you this letter, and I'm giving you what I gave you before, but I'm reminding you of the commandments of God, how you ought to keep them, so you could abound more and more, and when you've abounded more and more, you abound a whole lot more, and more and more above all that. That's where we're going. Father, we bow in your presence, and we thank you for this moment, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you that we can gather in a country freely, still, and carry Bibles, and worship, and sing, and praise, and pray in public. Oh, God, bless this country that we may continue to do so. We pray that in the name of Jesus, but we ask that you now take the broken word and bless it and multiply it, make it more than enough, made to the point there's leftovers. We can take it, share with others. From just this little message today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was given a, a book by somebody not too long ago, old, old book, and I was reading it, and, and they, one of the chapters they talked about a preacher who was almost neurotic about his health and worried about the fact that he would get something from somebody, and you know, he's always taking his pulse just kind of a health freak, but always taking his pulse to check how he was doing. And one day he he uh, got a barometer instead, a little handheld barometer, and stuck it in his mouth and pulled it out, and it said, dry and windy. <laughs> I hope that today that's not the case. That it won't just be dry and windy and blustery. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, I love these two little books. They were wrote on Paul's second missionary journey in short order. He had been to uh, that community, about 200,000 people. There was a church there. He is ministering to those people. Uh, they are a persecuted people. He's worried about them. He is writing to encourage their faith and to help them, spur them, encourage them along the way. He also talks about the fact they need to be ready for the Lord's coming. He writes to clarify and clean up some false thoughts. Chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, he reminds them about the coming of the Lord. 
But more than anything, he wants them to be ready for whenever that comes, whenever it comes. He wants them to be faithful to Christ. He wants them to be diligent about how they walk with God and before the people in their community. He wants them to be a light to their to the neighbors and to everyone. He wants them on fire for God. Wouldn't that be great for us too? Well, in chapter 4, verse 1, he uses a word that I just would like to just with a laser lock in on this morning, and it's that word in the King James, it's the word ought. Now, you probably maybe have a different translation in front of you, but in the King James um, is the word ought. I believe the NIV says, I ask and urge you. The Amplified Bible uses the word ought. Eugene Peterson in the message, he says, urge. The Living Bible says, we demand of you. RSV says ought. And I just want to, if I could stay with that word ought, it's an old word. It's not used in uh, uh, educated circles today as much as it used to be. But I grew up with that word ought. If dad says that I ought to do something, <laughs> I'd better do it. It's not a just a passing thought. It's not some trivial thing that he's thinking about. If he says that your son you ought to mow the yard today, the yard better be mowed when he came home from work. If mama told us we ought to do something, then it was not just passing thought. She expected us to do it. I grew up with that word, and that word meant something, and it held a lot of weight. You, if you ought to do something, you better do it. You get married and your wife says you ought to do something. Let me tell you, fellas, if you got any sense, you'll do it. <laughs> if she says you ought to be here by 4 o'clock, you better be there at 3.45. You know? She says you ought, to, you ought to get that for me for our anniversary. Let me tell you something. You better sell your fish and tackle and, and your boat. You better get it. Whatever you, If you got any sense, you'll make it happen. I grew up with that word, and I learned that uh, it meant something then. It means something now. Now, we use it casually. You say, well, let's go to that store. It ought to be cheaper over there. Uh, the mechanic said the car ought to be done in just a couple hours. Somebody says, well, you ought to, the check's in the mail. You ought to, you ought to get it by Tuesday. And some, some poor soul here says, he ought to be done preaching here in about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all have expectations, I know. <laughs> but when this word is used in Scripture, it's not casual. This is a, this is a word that, that comes to us where we are duty bound, we are morally obligated, we are, we are under compulsion, we are compelled, it behooves us to do something. The, the, this word in the original Greek language is so strong, and I can't emphasize this, it is so strong, ought, it is a command. It, it, is, it, is, it is a word that is not left up to a vote, or do you feel like it, or when you ever get around to it. No, it is an, an imperative that you and I are, are obligated under the Word of God, we must do it. And, and matter of fact, it is so strong, you can take out the word ought and put in the word must, and you have not changed Scripture at all. Okay? It is that strong a word, it is a command. Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, says, As we have received how you must walk and to please God. Same, same word. It is that strong. It's not left up to your opinion or let's take a vote on it or uh, what's the consensus of the community. Absolutely not. If you're a child of God, it is that strong. Are you with me? That's what that word means. So throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament, you encounter that word ought, it means something, folks. 
This is not just read it and pass by. And I think so many times we do that with that little word. And you say, well, the preacher's splitting hairs today. No, I'm not. That word means something. And so now that you know that, let's go on a little journey. Go to Luke chapter 18. <coughs> Luke chapter 18. Jesus is preaching and teaching. And Luke 18, verse 1. And I'm still hearing pages turning, so I'm going to tarry for a moment. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. I'm going to read that again. Men must always pray and not faint. That's what Jesus is saying. We are called. Now all Christians... All stripes, all colors, sizes, shapes, it doesn't matter. As a child of God, men and women, boys and girls, everybody included, everybody who is a believer in Jesus Christ are called to pray. Don't, don't say that some are called to pray, some aren't. We all are called to pray. That's how you become a Christian. That's how you continue in fellowship with the Lord. It is that prayer line, that lifeline with God, we are always to be in communication with the Lord. Now, I know you've got to clean the house, and you got to, somebody's got to take out the trash, and you've got to go to work, but we are called to be praying people. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, my house shall be called what? House of prayer. A house of prayer. You're getting it. That's, we are to be praying people. So don't just skirt this and say, well, that's just women work, or no, when I, when I feel like, no, we are called to pray. We, we, Nancy reminded us, in uh, the mission service the other night, when God wakes you up in the middle of the night, why does he wake you up? It's not just go to the bathroom. He wakes you up to pray. There's, there's a pressing need. And, and, and you may not even know what it's about, and I've had that happen before. Why am I awake? I don't even know of a burden. But it's a time to pray. And let me tell you what. You start praying, the old devil puts you back to sleep because he don't want you praying. <laughs> But Jesus said men ought to pray. Fellas, can you get a hold of that? A lot of, a lot of guys say, well, I need to work on the car. I need to mow the yard, whatever. Yeah, men ought to pray. If, if I can remind you of another man in Scripture by the name of Job. Remember Job? Clear back to the Old Testament. Job had problems, didn't he? But before he ever had problems, he was a man of prayer. Most people would say, well, I got problems, I need to start praying. He was praying before he had problems. If I can remind you in Job chapter 1, verse 1, says there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed or hated evil. And verse 2 says he's got seven boys and three girls. Verse 4 and 5, where I want to go, says that those grown-up kids, when they went out and feasted and partied uh, and invited everybody in and had a big time, verse 5 says the next morning when he got up having his devotions, guess what he did? It says in verse 5 that he rose and sent and sanctified them early in the morning and offered burnt offerings and according to the number of them all for Job said, Dad said, it may be that my kids sinned and cursed God in their heart. Thus did God, Job or Dad continually. Here's a man who gets it. He is going to pray down a safety net. He's going to pray for his kids and he's going to does it continually. God bless my family. Fellas, you need to be praying for your family. You need to be praying that God will protect your kids. You need to be praying for your marriage. You need to be praying for your home. You need to be praying for your life. You need to be praying for God to guide your children. If they're not saved, that they get saved, that God give them guidance in, in the decisions that they're making. You need, to be, you need to be praying a covenant over them and angels around them and the blessings of God over them. If you're not praying for your kids, you're missing it. All parents, wives, dads, husbands, we, but especially men. Did you know that as a man of God, it's not just as a, being the leader of the house, 
The Word of God says you're the spiritual leader of the house. It's on your shoulders. We say, well, I'll let the women take the kids to church. <coughs> well, no, it's, it's on the husband's shoulders. Now, if he doesn't, somebody's got to. But the truth is, that's what being a man is all about. We man up and pray for your kids. Do you know, fellas, what your number one needs are in your kids right now? Do you know what their number one prayer request is? A lot of guys, a lot of guys I right now know that they don't, they don't have a clue what the number one need is. We ought to know because we ought to ask them. When you're together with them, you ought to ask them, and how can I pray, be praying for you now? How can I be praying for you now? And let me take it a step farther. If you're willing and if you could, it's like, can I pray with you? Can I pray with you? Pick up the phone. Say, can I pray with you? Now, now, don't get hung up and say, you know, I don't know, preacher, I don't know all those religious words and I can't pray like somebody else and, and I get all tongue-tied. Let me tell you something. God doesn't care about them religious words. God cares about your heart. Don't, don't be intimidated by the devil and say, well, you know, I can't be doing that. Yes, you can. Be a man of God. We men ought to pray. Pray for your kids. Pray for your marriage. Pray for all of that. We, we ought to be doing that on a regular basis. And uh, you don't know what it would mean to your kids. If you're not doing it, you don't know what it would mean to your kids to have you say, I want to pray for you. If, you're have, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more God wants to bless your kids, pray for them. Men ought to Always to pray. Number two, let's go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter, not John 3.16, you know that, but 1 John 3.16. 1 John, that's clear back almost to Revelation. Almost. You know, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, Revelation. Almost to the back to the maps and the dictionary and all that. 1 John Chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us that we what? Ought. Ought. We must lay down our life for the brethren. Woo. Because he loved us, it ought to do something in our life and how we live and how we treat other people. Turn to page chapter 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we what? Ought also to love one another. There it is again. We are sent, compelled by the love of God to go out into the world because God came to this world for us. We ought, it, it ought to do something that we get out there in the world for the cause of Christ and tell others that uh, there's a God that loves us and we just simply love people because God loves us. And we go out there and we're good to people and kind to people and compassionate with people because God's been good and kind and compassionate with us. Amen? Amen. We're called to love the stranger. We're called to love the widows and the orphans. We're called to love our enemies. <laughs> We're called to love those who persecute us. We're called to love everybody because God so loved us. And because he loved us, it compels us and sends us forth that we go out and love others. Now, that's not too hard, too hard to gather in, but Jesus said, if you only love those that love you, well, what good is that? Even the sinners can do that. If you only love and make time for people that love and make time for you, we're not doing anything special, but if you will love those who don't love you and, and make time for those who won't make time for you and you will reach out to those who wouldn't even think about reaching out to you, that's different. That is when the love of God is shown in our hearts. Now, we can keep it under wraps and we can say, oh, how I love Jesus, but do we love others? John wrote, because he loved us and laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our life for others, and you do that because God loves us. And we do it because the love of God's in our heart. 
Now, the Lord reminded me of a little story, and I didn't want to share it, but I feel compelled to. When I was pastoring in Ohio, there was a, a family affiliated with the church. The wife would come. She was a precious, precious woman, white-haired, elderly lady. I just loved her. She was so sweet and dear. Her daddy was laying in a nursing home, been laying in a nursing home for years. And he, he, he was, uh, Calvin was bedfast, and he couldn't move arms, legs, nothing. All, he, he could move his eyes, and that was all. And I remember visiting that guy every month in the nursing home thinking, oh. I was younger then, and I was so ambitious and full of energy and always running and going and doing, and, and it just, I would, I'd pray with him, and I'd read him scripture and talk to him, and he couldn't even talk. And I thought, God help me. If that was me laying there, I, how would I deal with that? But he lived a long time like that. Well, she was, this, this lady was precious. She, she didn't get to come to church every Sunday because her husband wouldn't let her come all the time. And he was as opposite of her. I mean, it was the odd couple. If you ever thought about it, she was sweet and kind. And he was like 60 grit sandpaper. He was coarse. He was sarcastic. He was mean. He was rude. And I visited in their home a lot. And I did it out of the love of Jesus because of her and not him because he was just, ah. I tolerated him. I'll be honest with you, I really didn't love him because of the way he was. But I knew that she loved him because she married him. And I tried to love him. And he was, you know there are people who are hard to love. You ever met, you probably haven't, but I have. There, there are people just hard to love. I was trying, young pastor, and I'm trying to love him, and he just made it so hard to love him. And I remember the day, I did service for Calvin when he died. It wasn't long after I got a call. I went to see her. She had been to the doctor and got bad news. She was dying. It just broke my heart. Her husband sat there in his chair and never said a word. That bothered me. But I knew that God was doing something in his life, and, and it was complicated. I tried to minister to them in cards and calls and visits and over and over and over. And close to the end, we carried in food. We, we did it all as a church. We rallied around that family and, and did everything we could. And I did her funeral and did the best I could. And we just loved on them. And he never changed. He was just cold and sarcastic and me. And I remember, I thought, of that verse about casting your pearls before swine. And I said, God, forgive me. I shouldn't be thinking it. But that's how I felt. Okay? Some time passed. I don't know how long. Maybe three months, four months later. It's Wednesday night. I'm doing Bible study. It's Wednesday night. You know, you got to be in church on Wednesday night. I'm teaching. I'm right down front here. And that sanctuary and Maybe 20 people there. I'll never forget it. I can close my eyes. I can still see it happen. I'm up there teaching. We're partway into the, into the service. And the door opened in the back. There was double doors there. And then he came. Big guy. I mean, he made three of me easy. Big guy came in. And they couldn't see him. I could. And I thought, I'll be honest, I thought, and what's he up to now? Ah. <sighs> I thought, he's going to come up and punch me. And then I thought, second thought, I thought, well, at least there's witnesses here. Okay. <laughs> you know, a lot of people here. You know, there's witnesses. And I'm talking. They can't see him yet. He walks in. He doesn't sit down. He comes up. And he slowly walks up. And he comes all the way up that runner. And by now, people see him. Everybody knows him. And I'm standing there at my little lectern and my Bible. And I spoke first. I said, hi, Jim. And I don't know what to expect. And this big guy got up right up against me. And he smiled. And he took his arms. And he just hugged me. He just hugged me. 
squeezed me right into his chest. I'm about right here on him. He just, he just bear hugged me. And then he leaned over and said, I'm sorry. I love you. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, wow. And he held me for it seemed to be eternity. And then he let me go. I said, I love you too, Jim. He turned around. He didn't sit down. He just walked down the middle of the aisle. He walked out and he left. He had never been in the church the whole time we'd been there. He never came back. Everybody there was like, what was that all about? <laughs> Because I never told him how he had talked to me and how he treated me. I never said any of that. But two things jumped out at me. Number one, I knew in my heart God had done something in his life. Because Amen. if you knew what he was like, for him to publicly come into the church during a service, walk down and do what he did in front of these people, to all knew him, what that took, how God had humbled him. I knew God had done something in his life for him to say, I'm sorry, and number two, I love you. I didn't worry about him anymore because I knew God had done something in his life. And number two, I'll tell you something else. I knew at that moment in time, right then and there, he was a bigger man than I was. Because I judged him. And I was dead wrong. He was hurting. He was mad. God was taking his wife. He was going to be left alone. He was going to have to do it all. She had waited on him hand and foot. He didn't like that he was going to have to cook his own food and clean his own house and do his own laundry. And he was mad at God. He was mad at Christianity. He was mad at the church. And he was mad at the preacher. And I knew why, because he was hurt. Let me tell you something. People are a mess. People are a mess. But it's your job and my job to love them. We don't get to pick and choose. Jesus sent us out into the world to just love people. Yeah, they're not perfect, but we aren't either. Love them. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our life for the brethren. Turn the page. Chapter 4, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Here's what I can tell you. They may be hard to love, but if you will love them and do what's right and be good and kind to them, the day will come you'll be glad you did. You'll look back someday, even if they don't come say, I love you and I'm sorry. Even if they never return, I'll tell you what, someday you stand in front of God, you'll be glad you were good to them. Because that's what Jesus did, even while we were yet sinners. And he was good and kind and loved us, in spite of us. Turn the page to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Quickly share this with you before we close. Because I ought to be done by now. <laughs> Verse 13, James 4, 13. Go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow for. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away for that ye ought to say if the Lord will we shall live and do this or that. James is saying hey now listen up folks. Wake up. Those of you that's got your day timers full and you went in there and scheduled and penciled it in and you got all your plans and everything is scheduled neatly, he said, you don't even know what tomorrow holds. 
You don't even know this afternoon. It's not guaranteed. You have no clue. I don't either. And yet you go around like you're the master of the universe and you're in charge and it's all, you know, no. No, it's not. God's in control. And every once in a while he'll do something to remind us of that. Do you remember Jeremiah 18? Jeremiah's sent to the potter's house and he sees the man working at the wheel and, and, and fashioning something and all of a sudden he just stops and he squashes all that back together and starts all over again. And, and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and says, what time, O Israel, what time can I not do that with you? Can I not just reshape and reform and, and, and change things in your life? We say, oh, no, you can't, Lord. You're going to have to schedule an appointment because, uh, you know, my date time is full. God says, oh, yeah, watch this. <laughs> yeah, I can change your life in a second. You know that? Your whole world can change, and I've said it for years. Your whole world can change with one phone call. You don't even know what tomorrow is. You ought to say, if God will. Now, we tack that on. Just, well, Lord will. I'm going to do this and do that. Lord will. The truth is, you're going to do that anyway. We just use that Christian cliche. Well, Lord will. <clears throat> kind of like, you know, when we are sarcastic about other people and say, well, you know, he's just dumber than a load of rocks. Bless his heart. <laughs> <laughs> We do that with that same cliche. You know, it's just, Lord willing, Lord willing. Do we really know what we're saying? If we really grasp it, we understand that the will of God should be the most compelling thing about our life, that it's not what we want, it's what God wants. It's not what we're looking for, it's what God's looking for, that we are so moved and so given that God's will is done in our life and in our family that it doesn't matter anything. It's just whatever God wants. That's how we should be living. Get that? We ought to be saying that. If the Lord will. That's the driving force behind it all. Calvin Miller, I'll say that just in close. Calvin Miller wrote about a box in his living room. I've never, never forgot this. It was a wooden box. It was made in the 1800s, and it's not this replication that they do now of, of these old boxes that are, that are just decorations. This was one of them true crates, box, dovetailed corners, old, I mean, it's a time period piece. You look at it, you know this came out of the 1800s. Heavy duty. And he said the, the, the printing on it was still legible. You could still read it in bold letters. It said, Danger Dynamite. It was one of those they used at the magazine for the explosives. I mean, it's, it's made to withstand and to keep the contents right. Danger, dynamite. But he said, you know what, last time I looked at that, it was stuffed full of old newspapers and magazines. It's all it's used for. And then he said, that's just like today's Christians. Here we are, vessels made to possess the power of God, the glory of God, the dunamis of God, and we're full of old news. Meaningless trivia. Magazines that ain't nobody going to read, but we're hanging on to them. When you, we were destined for something great and powerful. And let the church get a hold of that, that we ought to be a praying people. We ought to be a loving people. We ought to be all about what God's doing. And all about our little deal we got going on. And you let that happen, you're going to have to get here an hour early to find a seat. Because the world will come running for a church like that. Praying people, loving people, all about, let's just jump in there with hand, both hands and feet. Whatever God's doing, that's where I want to be. Instead of trying to take what I'm doing and say, now, Lord, you just come on with me. 
We ought to just be running to the book of Acts saying, God, that's where I want to be living. Doing it now. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. We ought to be people of God. We ought to be people of prayer. We ought to be people of love. We ought to be people who are just given to the will of God. We ought to be a lot of things. And yet in this moment, Lord, we know we are so far from that high bar. But we bow, Lord, in your presence and we repent. Forgive us, Lord, for not praying when you call us to pray. Forgive us for not loving when we're supposed to love. And forgive us for not going and doing and being with the will of God. Oh, Lord, we ought to all repent. We all ought to get right with God. We all ought to be on fire for Jesus. We all ought to be getting ready for when you call us. We all, we all ought to be more than we are. So, Father, purge out the old leaven. Help us, Lord. And pour into us that new oil, that new wine, yep. the newness of God. And shake out the old. And shake up your church to where we are revived and we are ready and we are compliant with the Spirit. And we are broken and humbled. And you transform us out of what we are into what we're supposed to be. Oh, Jesus, have thine own way. Right now, we pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. I'm going to ask us to stand. We're going to close our service with a little chorus. We sing this a lot. It's used normally for new Christians. I think it applies to everybody. We're going to sing it without music. We're just going to sing it from our heart because that's where the best music comes from. It's the little chorus I have decided to follow Jesus. If you'd like to come and pray, God's moved on your heart. There's something he spoke to you about this morning. And maybe it's got something to do with the message. Maybe it doesn't, but he's called you to pray. And you'd like to come and kneel and pray and have some private time with the Lord. You do so. Let's just mind the Lord. Sing it with me. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning. Though, Though no, no one joins me, still I will follow. Though, Though no one, one joins me, still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Our Heavenly Father, 
I pray you send us out into a world that needs what we got. May we be so full of you that we just got to tell somebody about Jesus. Yes. Help us to be the prayer warriors, the loving folk of God that are just engaged in doing your work. We pray that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you for being here. Give me just a moment. I'll meet you at the door. You've got your work cut out for you. Go and be disciples. Thank <laughs> you.